On today's episode, we break down what we think will be some overreactions to fantasy football moves. Some of my overreaction takes are, in fact, underreactions uh, for my partners here on the show. You'll find out all about that. And Best Ball Breakdown, it is back. We're talking about Best Ball Tips. Hey, make sure you enjoy this video. Subscribe, leave us some comments. Enjoy. <laughs> Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. It's Thursday. It's May 18th. We're the fantasy footballers. Get it right. And we got a show for you. You were you were bossing people around there. Like well, this like, is the day we are the footballers. Those are just more like just deal with it. Proclamations. Yeah, but you were spitting yeah. facts like fire. Yeah. Just basic facts about the show. I'm just telling you how you you, you presented it. Uh, Mike Wright, Jason Moore, Andy Holloway, excited to be with you. We have an overreactions episode. Not going to do what y'all think I'm going to do. Which is, it's good. We've each selected a couple things that we believe the fantasy football community at large will overreact to for the 2023 season. Because if there's one thing we're good at, mm -hmm. it's overreacting to a lot of different things. Yeah, and usually it has a lot to do with recency bias because I don't know if you know this, but whatever happened last year is certainly going to happen this year, right, guys? Well, it could, Jason, right? Anything that's happened before is going to happen again. I'm sure that's how it works. Got a quick question to talk about as well. Want to throw a thank you out there to the Foot Clan, everybody that has picked up a ticket for the Megala Show, oh. our biggest live event ever we are doing uh what is the date saturday august 26 we will be live at the palace theater in la i would uh, by the time you're hearing this i think we're over halfway to having it sold out so yep. a lot of you have picked up tickets if you want a chance to go please go to ballerslive.com <laughs> shows brought to you by underdog fantasy are you did you want to comment on that I, I mean, I was going to ask though. I mean, I don't know if the click clack came through, but Jason's just like throwing a stylus around I, here. I picked up a stylus and I whoopsie doozle. What were you going to do? I was just going to hold it. it and then I threw it. It slipped out of his hands. <laughs> I often hold this. It's, you know, it's a little idiosyncrasy and I <laughs> no, decided I, I to throw too, it. So you just, you picked it up. I picked it up and uh, just threw it across the room. If you want to see stuff like that live, go to ballerslive.com, grab a ticket. And we'll see you at the end of August, right before the season begins. It's going to be awesome. A couple other things that are going on right now. We are, uh, what, under two weeks now to the Ultimate Draft Kit. So uh, exciting times. That's coming out on June 1st, ultimatedraftkit.com. Behind the scenes, we now have every single player statted for all three of us. We're looking at the data, comparing it, getting all the tools built. Everything is looking excellent and it's a lot of fun so these next couple of weeks is where we're we're putting polish on it and and Jason's getting it ready be, for launch he'll be throwing things all over the place all uh, right just everything on the wall see what sticks yeah uh anything else going on brooks you we need to talk about well with the draft kit i know you guys are pumped we're recording a hundred video player profiles oh, over the next two weeks i'm gonna need a sandwich yeah um we do we've got a hundred plus player profile videos as part of the udk and uh the technology the artificial intelligence is not at the point yet where we we can avoid doing it so okay. we're gonna have to do it you know the truth here foot clan if we could be honest for a second man do i hate doing those videos <laughs> however i love the results of those videos i genuinely learn a lot because we all come with our own research our own information when we're talking through these players i feel like those videos make me so much smarter. So if you haven't, if even if you've already got the UDK, you get it every year, whatever. If you haven't really partaken in those player profile videos, you should check them out. They are extremely valuable. Just, All right, just taxing. Yeah, well, that, that's what it is, right? It's more of like the marathon thing, and you're not a marathon guy. 
No, I'm like a, not what? even a walk guy. Uh, the Dynasty podcast new episode came out yesterday as well. They talked about range of outcomes for some players, some some hot players like Anthony Richardson, Jameer Gibbs, and Kyle Pitts. All right, quick question for today. Aaron in Oklahoma wants to know, says, hey, ballers, longtime listener. I love the show. I am the commissioner of my very first Dynasty League. We have our startup draft in June. My question is, how do you guys go about daily waivers and the settings for those, specifically on game days? Any insight would be awesome. What do you think? I mean, ours is, is pretty simple. We have the waivers uh, run every single day. They're, they're locked on uh, Tuesday so that you can make your waiver transactions, get them ready for the week. But every morning, uh, somewhere depending on the league, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., the waivers will run in a fab auction-style bidding war, and that's it. And so for game day, we've, we've discussed, and I know in some leagues – um, that day it'll run in the morning and then it'll be open waivers for the rest of the day. In a dynasty league, I don't think you really need to do that. Most players are on rosters. And so you have you, a pivot option because your bench is 18 to 20 deep. Yeah. You don't need to be like, oh no, I didn't see this coming. I need to find someone off of a dynasty waiver. So really just simple and having it run every single morning, I think is the way to go. We have open waivers after the waiver time period on in our redraft league though. Or in our keeper league. Right. Yep. When you do need to have pivot options, which has been a uh, – that tweak was very nice. And and with all the new Dynasty Leagues starting up, that being this time of year, we have a new article, How to Commish a Dynasty Fantasy Football League from Matt DeSorbo uh, on the website. So go check that out. If you have any questions, if you want to start a league, start another one. If you already are a commish and you want to find out how bad you've been, go read that article and step up your game. Yeah, and I think it was the last episode, our mailbag episode, when when someone brought up that they had found, but you know, a great dynasty league to go and play on the Discord channel in the Foot Clan league. So we're trying to provide ways for you to get into to good leagues, try something new out, whether it's a keeper, a dynasty, a redraft league with some other dedicated players. Yeah, Papa Josh, who runs, yeah, the, he runs the community, including the the Discord. He says it's it's popping. Over on Flickland Leagues. .com. That sounds like something he would say because he's yeah. he's kind of hip. very hip. very young hip. Yeah, he said actually he didn't. I I'm sorry guys, I lied. He said it is the bussin bussin. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's him. Which yep. is ironic because he also said that about Knight Rider, one of his favorite shows. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. that's oh great. Bussin bussin. Yeah, no cap. No cap. <laughs> even, Mike, even Mike, there are very few things in this world Mike can say where he's Dude, not still cool. My kids, and that is my, one of them. My kids have a language, and I'm like, I, I can't do this. Like they break I, all of that out. I oh yeah, wow. oh, really? Oh yeah. My my kids have all the cool YouTube words. I I got in on Yeet finally. Did you? Like I mean, this is a, a while back when Yeet was having a moment. I feel mm -hmm. like you're late oh. to the that part. Oh no, that's, this, I'm saying this was oh, okay. When they first started using it, I was like, what is this? But then it's just, it's a fun word for when you're like throwing something okay. or someone's jumping and you just yeet. It's a good time, but. Yeah, I mean, I haven't really gone there. Oh, well, that's that's not it. You need to take over surprise. our TikTok, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, <laughs> let's move forward. I'm not going to do what you all think I'm going to do, which is just pull this out. No, but you should you should really check out Knight Rider. That that thing is <laughs> oh with, with the Hoff. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, all right, we're jumping into players or situations that fantasy football managers have the potential to overreact to in 2023. We are going to try to steady a few ships today and, and kind of you know we're supposed to react, right? I mm -hmm. mean, players you must players emerge. Um, certainly, if a player has a breakout season. You know, you don't throw that out the window and say, oh, they're going to return to what they were the year before. But an appropriate reaction is what you're looking for because you're in a league with 11 other players or, or, or nine other players, and there's going to be a lot of reactions by those players. And so you, you need to know where you should really be buying the hype, uh, whatever the case may be. And so I'm going to let Jason kick it off with um, a, one of his first kind of potential overreactions for the fantasy football universe. Yeah, uh, you know, this is the season of Dynasty we've been talking about. And I think that because we've talked about rookies, rookie drafts, we did Dynasty Week, and, and, and that's what people are consuming right now, mixed with what we have seen 
over the last couple of years, the extreme explosion of dual threat, monstrous fantasy football seasons at the quarterback position. I believe that there is going to be, and already is. I mean, I know there already is based on average draft position and an underdog and, and everywhere that you're drafting right now. In redraft, non-dynasty leagues, the leagues that you're going to do in August, there's going to be a massive reach, I believe, an overreaction for Anthony Richardson, rookie quarterback for the Colts, and people are going to say, I'm swinging for the fences, and he's going to be you know, a Lamar Jackson, a Jalen Hurts, a Josh Allen, a, a Justin Fields. He's going to be one of those huge, monstrous performers in fantasy. He didn't say Trey Lance, but go on. Right, no. Um, and, and I don't think that that is – right I don't think that's a good process I don't think that is going to happen and I say this as someone who completely believes in Anthony Richardson I actually think he will develop into a good thrower of the football uh, and be a successful NFL quarterback and in dynasty leagues I love taking him high because I do think he's going to have a great season but when you look at Josh career. Allen uh, yes yeah, sorry thank you uh, a, a great career um, he's not going to have a great season and if he has Fantasy success, it certainly is not going to come when it matters when you draft players, which is the first half of the season. You go back and you look at Josh Allen's rookie year. He he was not very good, but if you look at the first five or six games that he got mit injured in the middle, he was atrocious, abysmal. You couldn't play him. You would have dropped him four weeks in. You're watching clips of him making bad, awful passes, which is going to happen to Anthony Richardson as well because his accuracy is something that he's got to work on, his uh, throwing motion, getting his feet set, all of that. He's not going to come out on fire to start the NFL, and I, I think he'll be on waivers in week four, five, six, and you could scoop him up and maybe towards the end of the year. You look at Justin Fields. Justin Fields averaged just over 10 fantasy points a game and he was he came in as a better prospect. He did. Uh, Anthony Richardson is a better athlete, and so you could say, "Oh well, fantasy. We got to get those mobile quarterbacks. You score more running the ball. All of that is true." But the overreaction here is thinking that all of a sudden, because these other great quarterbacks have developed the fields, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, is going to say, "Well, now somehow Anthony Richardson, with 13 college starts under his belt, is going to come in." and do what none of these guys, none of these great quarterbacks did for the beginning of their rookie season, which is perform really, really well. Uh, I, uh, you know, And so if you are picking him as a top 10 quarterback, which is where his ADP is right now, that to me is a wasted pick. And, you know, obviously, um, look, I, I hope he uh, shames me here and I can eat crow on this and he just comes out guns blazing and is great to start his rookie year, but it's just not going to happen. Uh, RG3, would that be one of the cases where he did work out for fantasy players? Cause he, oh, yeah. I remember he started on fire his yeah. first rookie season. No, he was absolutely fantastic. But again, a much, much better prospect coming in. I mean, there were so many people here that thought, uh, you know, before the combine, that thought Anthony Richardson is not a first-round quarterback. And and plenty of people still like them. I mean, the talent was obviously there. But if you look at his numbers in college, his passing success rate, he he is a a work in progress, not like RG three. I think the hard part with Richardson and why why you're going to see overreactions is it is going to be flashy, whether it's preseason training camp. You know you know what the the hype train season is like, and so. You know, I thought when you were talking about him that you might use uh, – you said he's not going to be – I thought the word that was coming was consistent at at a, at the very least, right? You might have a, a game where he – you know, if he has a 65-yard run, like that's going to make his week. Yeah, for a touchdown. But, exactly, for a touchdown. But if, if you don't – you know, historically you have some really good players that didn't have success as rookies is what you're saying, and, and he's going to be – and he's not as good of a prospect. And so – um, it could be some growing pains, and that may put him onto waiver wires, and you wasted whatever it will be. What I mean, what round do you think he's going to go in redraft? Seven? Yeah, I mean, I, around there. I, I think he will go in the single digit rounds, which <clears throat> someone's going to take a shot, right? Someone's going to say <clears throat> the value, the upside, the swing for the fences mentality says upside wins championships, and so I'm going to draft him instead of Geno Smith. You know? Yeah, like he's. It's a difficult 
I, I think it's a difficult decision what to, what to do with Richardson in a redraft league because like, it, like back when Trey Lance came out and you didn't know for sure when he was going to be the starter, you just because he was the third overall pick that they traded up for all the probability and like historically speaking, it meant Trey Lance will get in sooner than later. And it was how good can he be? And he felt like a a, a solid pick there to stash on the back of your bench. Uh, and it's it's hard for me to not feel that way about Anthony Richardson, just as well, he, as a stash. But if he's going as the quarterback ten, that does create a value problem. And I, well, the the problem will be you need a quarterback if you're waiting there. Are you taking the second quarterback in the he, sixth or seventh round? Because you're, because you're probably not. And so, are you going to wait and lose out on Tua or lose out on Dak that can start for you week one and give you consistent? I numbers? think you're taking like you're going Richardson, and like, you're drafting him as your first quarterback, but you're not drafting him to play as your first quarterback. And then you grab someone like Kirk Cousins, like Kirk or, Cousins or Daniel Jones, who will go later, and you know that. They'll probably finish as a top 12 quarterback, which isn't saying a ton, but they will bring you at least some stability as you wait for Richardson to progress. But it's it's a very difficult decision. Yeah, I mean, he certainly will have games where if he has two rushing touchdowns, he'll be fine. But, you know, to, to illustrate this, over the last decade, 19 rookie quarterbacks have had a sub-60% completion rate, and I think that is the projection, I would imagine, for all of us, that he's, he's yes. going to be sub-60% on his passing completion rate like he was at college, and only one quarterback over that time has finished as a top 12, and that was Andrew Luck. Again, you know, that's that's the prospect barometer now. That's the name where it's like, best prospect since Andrew Luck is yeah, the name always thrown there's out. been one. three rookie quarterbacks with 600-plus rushing yards, RG3, Allen, and Lamar Jackson. Allen did it, but still only averaged 17 fantasy points a game. Well, and the thing so is... So that could be like your barometer. 17 fantasy points a game, you'd be like, oh, hey, that's, that is not bad, but if you look at his rookie season... The first half was abysmal. Then he kind of got it together, ran more, had more success at the end. And I, I do think there will be success rookie season, but it's not going to be a good draft pick. And I think the – like if, if Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts and Justin Fields didn't just happen, if those guys – there nobody would be drafting Anthony Richardson like this. That's, that's where I think the overreaction is coming from. Do you guys think, though – so that 600-yard mark, do you think Richardson will make it past that? I'm taking – I would take under that. I've got him right there. I've got him over that. I have him okay. about almost 800 yards on Ooh, the on okay. the ground. Um, because I think when the when the going gets tough in the NFL, yeah, he, he's going to lean on what he is exceptionally gifted at, and that's going to be that athleticism. All right, Mike, what is an overreaction that you see heading uh, fantasy players' way? So it brings me uh, no delight to share this one because. DJ Moore ha is a player that I love. I think is extremely talented. I think that DJ Moore has been in impossible situations over and over and over. And each offseason it's been, well, it can't certainly be worse. Maybe this is the year that it gets better. Then you have the big time trade. I think trade. that was a direct quote <laughs> from like the Sam Darnold arrival. Maybe. maybe. Uh, you have the huge trade. He moves from Carolina. He goes to the Chicago Bears. Excitement in the streets for for uh, the, for from the Bears for Justin Fields, who feels like he could be developing into a like not only a stud for fantasy football, but maybe he's a good quarterback. TBD. But you get him a number one overall wide receiver, and we've seen several uh, several you know examples of this over the last few years. Of like Stephon Diggs goes to Buffalo. Out of nowhere, Josh Allen is is an elite quarterback from a just like a middling uh, passer. Now he's great. You have A.J. Brown goes to Jalen Hurts. His passing numbers go through the roof. You have DeAndre Hopkins comes to uh, Arizona with Kyler Murray. They're both fantastic. And he's D.J. Moore is being drafted like he got an upgrade. He did not. As much, I love Justin Fields. I think that he can be good. I think he's going to be great for fantasy football. But not because he's an elite passer yet. That is just that it's not there, and the volume is not there. Last year, DJ Moore sixth in deep targets. Justin Fields last year ranked twenty eighth in deep adjusted completion percent last year. That is twenty uh, eighth. That's not good. That is that is in fact near the league bottom. 
last year in Justin Fields starts. The guys, this is so bad. Okay, so we have the Bears wide receivers. They averaged 18 fantasy points per game. The group. The whole group. The group. The wide receivers. All together. The wide receivers, if you put them all together, you don't have a wide receiver one if you combine all their numbers. Last year, in just two total weeks, we had a wide receiver, wide receiver score more than 12 points, and that was Dante Pettis in week oh, six yeah. and Darnell Mooney in week nine. It It's just it's not there yet for, for Justin Fields. And on top of that, the volume is not going to be there. He there, went from Carolina to a – there was like – Two options, I believe, that it could have been a lateral or worse move for DJ Moore to go to, and he went to one of those places, and and yet he's still being drafted uh, very, very high in best ball right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. The situation – look, it wouldn't be a story for the offseason to see things like Justin Fields is – he seems to be really improving as a – passer heading into the year if he was already there right you don't have those stories if he had already achieved that goal Darnell Mooney he's going to be back he was gone for a big portion of the year Cole Komet will be part of the offense Chase Claypool second round draft selection <laughs> swapped for Chase Claypool it, it, it's funny but Claypool will be involved in this offense yes, as well will. and so what has DJ Moore shown us in the past Great player that has big games. Hard to predict when those are going to be. Touchdowns are very difficult for him to uh, to reach. You know thresholds that are relevant for fantasy. In in underdog fantasy best ball right now, he is going as the wide receiver twenty one. That is in front of DeAndre Hopkins. That is in front of Keenan Allen. I mean, in front of Keenan. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, I mean, that's, that's it's just. I want it to happen so bad. It's the invisible upside. We haven't it, seen DJ Moore with a Bears uniform on. and That part is true. And you did bring up cases that I, I'm afraid that you might have laid on accident one of those like jungle traps. A bear, a punji pit. Yeah, with like the leaves over the top yeah. because you were trying to talk people out of DJ Moore, which is not something you do very often. But then you said <laughs> Stephon Diggs and Josh Allen and then A.J. Brown and Jalen no, Hurts and then I'm Hopkins not, and Kyler Murray. I'm not setting and the trap. All I heard I'm was... Pointing at the bait. That's all I heard is trip. what if, <laughs> what if this time it could happen for us. Um, but yeah, he he is shaping up to be based on his draft position a potential bust, uh, because we we have hopes and dreams, and I don't blame anybody for for having them. But yeah, it's it's compelling. All right, uh, my first overreaction that I I've been wanting to talk about this one for a while. So a lot of notoriety has been given to the offensive coordinator situation in Dallas. And that began with kind of this, you throw your hands up and you go, this has been an incredibly great offense yes. under Kellen Moore for many years. And here they are cutting bait on Kellen Moore and adding the, and I looked this up. I think I got to confirm through Kyle, Brian Schottenheimer. That's the least sexy name you can possibly add to your coaching <laughs> staff. Isn't that what we confirm Kyle? He's pretty low on the sex. He's meter. low yeah. on the sex yeah. meter. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, when you add Brian Schottenheimer, he comes with like a bus load of like a, a symphony just playing sad sounds because you know, in our fantasy football world, he represents a running game. Uh, look, I'm not going to let you sit back here and be smirched the name of Brian Schottenheimer, who in 12 years as an offensive coordinator has. Finished uh, with a top fifteen offense once, right? Uh, in yards, and I'm going with total yards. Let me get two, two out of twelve years. He's been in the top fifteen, sir. No, I mean he That's makes you want to shoot yourself right in the, in the Heimer. One of the time. Yeah, I mean this is so. So there's a lot of storylines there, but the one that Who's, I want to who sees that's like yeah. That's that's the stuff. That's the stuff that we need around did he, here. Did he win? A championship in Seattle? Was he there during that time, or did he come afterwards? Let's see. He was there. Kyle doesn't know. 2018 to 2020. The first thing Kyle doesn't know. How dare you? Um, I, I don't. I think, after. Think, he yeah, I think he came afterwards. It was after. after. Um, so he doesn't even have that on his on his resume. But listen, the fear here is that Dallas will be way more run heavy. And I think the overreaction is that there will be some sort of negative impact to CD Lamb. And what I'm here to correct, what I'm here to 
control is an overreaction that casts a negative light on CD Lamb. It's not something I agree with. I think CD Lamb is a he, he's not kind of good. I think he's an elite option, one of the best receivers in football, and Dallas already ran the ball a lot. They were fifth. They ran 45% of the time last year. That is the highest rate in McCarthy's career. So I don't know how much more they can even run. Right now, they removed Ezekiel Elliott from the offense, and you've got Tony Pollard, and you've got Ronald Jones, and uh, what, Malik Davis? Malik Davis. So you don't necessarily... And Deuce. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's a little guy. He's, he's... Um, <clears throat> Deuce Vaughn. So, so I don't think the personnel necessarily lends to... To, to going up above 45%. And the truth is, is what is the value of these targets when they have the opportunity to play action pass? Something that they're very capable of doing. They went 12 and five last year. CD lamb was the essence of that offense. He was targeted on 26% of his routes. That was seventh best in football, 107 receptions. And there's a very small list of players with a hundred plus receptions and 1300 receiving yards at the age of 23. He's one of the guys with Jefferson, with Hopkins, with Brandon Marshall, and then Anquan Bolden in the last decade. So to me, this is not a situation where I am panicking about CeeDee Lamb. He is the kind of player that demands targets. And when you watch the football or when you watch the Cowboys play football last year, it almost, you know, that's where Dak's eyes go to because he is creating separation. He wins at the point of attack. I have no concern that this offensive shift is going to hurt CD Lamb. And the other part is, is they were they were playing with the lead so often last year, the third highest in the NFL. That's not something that necessarily replicates in a tough division. I think we all agree the Giants are pretty good, the Eagles are pretty good. You will be forced to abandon your philosophy at times if you are losing in a football game, and all of those opportunities are going to go to Lamb. So that's I'm just worried that if you know, if you want to adjust them a little bit because you like somebody else's situation a, a tad more, cool. I get it. It's the Schottenheimer fear. But I don't think it's going to impact CeeDee Lamb very much, and I'm going to scoop up the value. Yeah, I, I've still got him as a as a top 10 wide receiver because he's so talented. He's the clear number one for this team. Dak is a good quarterback. I do have fears, even though efficiency might go up, if volume comes down, you've got a healthy Michael Gallup. You have, um, you know, an, an, an additional Brandon Cooks because they're they're – depth chart last year was like cd lamb and and crackers um to you know it was just a bunch of nothing <laughs> out there and so i i feel like his target market ritz, share will come down ritz. i was thinking like saltines like yeah, something ritz, that's gonna dry your mouth ritz are ritz, buttery yeah. ritz are really nice ritz are, too, are, are ritz cookies no, no, are they that no good? they're not no, that they're good crackers. too salty too salty too salty i mean i've really. had salt, i've had like Caramel, salty cookies that are like real good. Yeah, but they're, they're still the sweet. There is no sweet in a. There's Ritz. no sweet compliment. Is there? So a, wait, if you put a little bit of like Nutella on a Ritz, now you're talking. I don't <laughs> know if it's a cookie, but I'm in. It, what what's like the third cracker? Uh, uh, you're saying saltines and Ritz yeah. own the joint. It's got to be the uh, the wheat thins. That yeah, you wheat talk thins about. is what comes to mind. That's a cracker. See, yeah. th those are kind of like poser crackers. Those are awesome. <laughs> those those are, hold good. on, I'm pulling the. That's a cracker. Wheat thins are a wheat are thins are what? definitely in the cracker aisle. What else would it be? What else would you call it? A thin? <laughs> just, I mean, it is a wheat thin, but wheat thins are crackers. Triscuits, have if, if got to get their name, they're, they're still holding on to their. Yeah, that's not. A that's cracker. like a triscuits are somewhere in the Bis most well known. It's somewhere between a biscuit and a tricycle. <laughs> Yes, Mike. That's, That's why it. they named it a Triscuit. Yes, that is and correct. And now our Slack channel is getting various pictures of you got those Keebler Club crackers. Yeah. Oh yeah. Those yeah. are very You've good. got the Townhouse yeah. Originals. But we're to, not to predominantly my, a cracker show. I just dug to in a little bit. My point. I do think that the the options that Dak has to throw the ball to are better this season than they were last season. If he throws the ball, you know, significantly fewer times, and then there are other good options to throw the ball to, I I don't think CeeDee Lamb is going to have a bad year. He's too good. But I do worry, you know, last year he was the wide receiver six. I've got him moving down a few spots this season. All right, uh, which might just be reaction versus overreaction and burying him. Uh, let's take a quick break and back with three more overreactions for 2023.
All right, we are back, and Jason has another overreaction. I I don't know where you're going to go here. I'm afraid that I'll want to push back. I So uh, this is one that I think people are going to hate. And by people... Well, I, is it wrong? Uh, no, it's correct. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Just making sure. Th what I'm going to say is correct, and I don't think a lot of people are going to like it. <laughs> and I, I'm really curious if either one of you are going to like it or completely disagree. So here's uh, what I think the overreaction... What I'm seeing as overreactions, I'm looking at like these underdog best underdog best ball drafts and seeing how people are really drafting. When they're putting their money on the line, who are they going after? Where are they going after them? And I think people are overreacting to the top of the tight ends from what happened last year. It's one of those situations where Travis Kelsey. I mean, I've seen him go number four overall in uh in a you know that in round one. He doesn't ever get past seven in the first round. He is a middle of the first round pick. And let me tell you something. If what happens last year happens this year, he is worth every ounce. Of, take him with the 101. And, and so people are right to say, hey, I'm going to spend my 105 on Travis Kelsey. If he is the same, not just him, but the tight end position is the same this year, as it was last year. Sep, here's the thing. It's not. And it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be close to the, the same. The tight ends? The tight end situation is not going to be close to the same. We have recency bias because we look at what just happened and we say, well, that's what's going to happen. What just happened five straight years? <laughs> no, 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 no. It five, did not. Five straight years Didn't for, even for come Kelsey. Didn't close to happening. Kelsey did. did. not come close to happening the last five years. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, that's the data I have. What's the difference between 105 and 1,411 and 110 and 1,312. Here's the difference. What the difference is is the tight end two, the tight end three, the tight end four, the tight end five, the rest of the position. Last year, Travis Kelsey lapped them. Last year was – well, first of all, Travis Kelsey scored more fantasy points last year than anyone since Jimmy Graham in 2011. So you're, you're talking a decade of, uh, performance here. Fantastic. Even if he does it again – we need the rest of the tight ends to collapse. Kelsey scored 5.2 fantasy points and half point scoring. More per game than the next best tight than tight end two. 120 more fantasy points. That was out. I think I'm getting confused. Outlandish. So, so you listen. said that Kelsey so Kelsey can do it again, but what is your point about the other tight ends? My point is that you his just said that value, if he did it again, it'd be worth him at four. No, if what happens to tight ends last year happens again where he's scoring 5.2 fantasy points more than the second best tight end then it's worth it then it would be worth it but it's not going to happen it just it never happens like that kelsey outscored the number 2 by by 88.9 fantasy points over the last 5 years the largest gap from number 1 to number 2 was only 35 fantasy points and on average the tight end one scores 1.3 fantasy point more than the tight end two but what happened last year was Andrews got injured and Waller got injured and Kittle or uh um Pitts got injured Hawkinson was only good the second half of the year because after the trade now he was I believe he finished as a tight end too they're all the tight ends sucked I mean drastically they were horrific I looked at the top five over the last decade and basically four th or two through five were just abysmal this last year compared to every other year that fantasy football has been played. So this year, Andrews is healthy. They've got a passing coordinator. Waller is healthy. He could be the number one option now. He wasn't going to be with Devontae Adams last year. Uh, Hawkinson is on the new team that values his passing role. Kyle Pitts could still have a breakout. I'm in on Kyle Pitts this year. And my point is that if, Ka if Travis Kelsey scores – the same as the average has been, 1.2 fantasy points more than the next best tight end and a few fantasy points more per game than the fifth best tight end, it's not going to be worth giving up the player that you are sacrificing at number five, number six. This is the highest the tight end has gone in as long as I've been playing fantasy football. And that's to make nothing of, to say nothing of the fact that he is a, he's an elder state, statesman, you know, I I know we've talked about the immortal years being Zeus and that he's, you know, still in his prime. Obviously, he was awesome last year. Coming off of 
that of the last year. Right. Yeah. So my was great. my whole point is what happened to tight ends last year was the, was a true outlier just statistically historically over the last decade it it hasn't happened like what happened last year and I think that is pushing him to this uh, elite status that is probably an overreaction. Okay, my only my only logical pushback there would be there's a difference between the historical average happening and you getting the ones right that it, did it. That's where I was going to go. And so Kelsey specifically, you know what you're getting with Kelsey because he has the long history. Just because other tight ends in the past have performed close to him, it's still been difficult to predict which ones will do it in the past. It, it's like it, Andrews. But I, last year was very anomalous in the amount of injuries and non-secondary options that were viable. If you waited and you didn't go in on Kelsey – you just were burnt and had somebody much infer more inferior. Yeah, I mean, I mean, two years ago, Kelsey wasn't even the tight end one. It was Mark Andrews. So, sure, I, I think Mark Andrews is pr pretty much a lock to be the tight end two. If I think that's the, part of the discussion to me is it's Kelsey at one or Andrews at like it's those two guys and Andrews carries risk. I think it, I do too. Because like at my projection for that team is they're gonna they're gonna pass a bunch more. And Andrews will be the top target. But again, like Zay Flowers, a healthy Rashad Bateman, if Odell Beckham is anything, like these are variables that could take target share away from, from Mark Andrews, where Travis Kelsey is locked. And Travis Kelsey isn't just the best tight end. Travis Kelsey is a player who can win you a week. He's not just going to accumulate the numbers that by the end, oh, he's the number one guy. It's, no, he, he gave me three weeks out of the year where he, he caught three touchdowns. He caught – four touchdowns in a week this past year. So that's that's where I'm okay going in on on Kelsey that early. He and he just he keeps getting it done over and over and over where even the rest of the players in the first round carry more risk than he does even at his age. Yeah, I mean, are you moving away from, have you taken him in any of your in your drafts? I've I've taken him if he's dropped to the back of the first I, I mean I'm looking at a draft at I'm the in. Turn, uh, the I'm turn. looking at a draft I'm in right now is just the one that I'm on the clock You in. can always do that, Jason. I can. Um I I'm, I'm pretty much always on the clock. Right now I'm looking at that draft. Kelsey went <laughs> this number This show gets in the way. It does. I need to wrap Jason's this up. Priorities. <laughs> My clock is ticking. Um Kelsey went 5. He went ahead of Tyree Kill, went ahead of Austin Eckler. Diggs, A.J. Brown, Devontae Adams, Saquon Barkley, B. John Robinson. Like, See, I think that's okay. And and everybody does. And th yeah. This is what I'm calling, I'm trying to say, I think people are overreacting here. I think that's too far. But that, but that it is... Would have, it would have been, um, I think the offseason the Chiefs had at wide receiver is also, it was like there's nothing to dissuade you from him. That was part of it. You know, right now, oh boy, no McCole Hardman and no Juju, and they added... James and Rashi Rice, and you're just like, well, here we go again. But, yeah, I mean, there's uh, – last year was very, very difficult to find somebody anywhere that could compete with Travis Kelsey on a week-to-week -week basis, whether or not you got it right or wrong. You just didn't have the option. Waller's been deleted for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this year there are some names. I mean, I love Goddard this year. So, obviously, if you go in on Kelsey in the first round, you don't get to try to sh shoot your shot on a Goddard or – you know, you have, like you said, a Pitts break, uh, breakout. I like Njoku with Deshaun Watson after him getting an off season. I mean, there are there are some names out there that are more interesting, and you you a hundred percent, no matter what you believe about Kelsey, you remove that flexibility from your roster if you're committed to tight end early. If tight end two through five ends up being more what it's been over the last several years versus what it was last year, then the advantage he provides you. Just isn't going to be the same, and it's also the 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 scarcity of the position, and like when you're in the first round and you miss out on like, oh, I didn't get Tyree Kill, I didn't get Stephon Diggs, I didn't get this player. Like, oh, but I got Jamar Chase, or I got Devontae Adams. If you if you don't take Kelsey, your emergency parachute that you feel good about is Mark Andrews, and that's it. Like where. So you're, I mean, that that round is going to be going through quick, and you're going to be like, "Oh crap!" If my entire plan is to go in on, I'm not going to take Kelsey here because I want Andrews, and then he goes before your your slot. I mean, then your your entire strategy there is blown up. All right, Mike, give me an overreaction. Another one. All right. So 
this one is it honestly this one is not heavy in statistics it's just let's point out a situation and a a person's ADP and go uh what's going on here because I just made a case uh, against DJ Moore who is the wide receiver 21 well right now I'm looking at underdog in best ball this person is the wide receiver 17 wide receiver 17 and you go uh well when's the last time you played football well what if I told you in week one it will have been Almost 700 days wow. since he played football. Is that right? <laughs> it better be right because so, that's what Kyle's telling me. It's Calvin Ridley who he got. He had an entire year where he was suspended because of uh, he he put a bet down on a football game. Before that, we only saw four weeks of him in the uh, the what was that the 2020 20, when, when when did he last play? Goodness, 2012. 1881, October <laughs> yeah. 24th, 2021. Quill pens were still the thing. Yes. So so he put, appeared uh, <laughs> back in 2021. He appeared in five games. And look, I, we don't know exactly what was going on with Calvin Ridley because he left the game to go take care of, of mental health issues. Was that affecting him on the field? Probably. But looking at the numbers that he put up on the field in those five games where he was – he was finally the guy. Julio Jones was gone. It was Calvin Ridley was going to be the number one wide receiver for the Atlanta Falcons, and he was used that way. We're talking in those five games, an average of a 27% target share. 27%. And he finished inside of the top 24 I, one time. It was 700 days ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. It was, it was painful. And again, not to – try and take anything away from from what the man was dealing with but the last time we saw him play football when we didn't know can he really be the number one guy because he had always played with Julio Jones and it's it's the same like it's the Juju situation of Juju's putting up incredible years we're like yeah well he's playing with Antonio Brown of course Juju Smith Schuster can be the number one guy no he can't he's <laughs> like no that's not what he does on the football field and now he goes he gets traded to the Jacksonville Jaguars which that's a fine team situation to be in. You're like pass friendly, Trevor Lawrence, except Christian Kirk just had a fantastic season after getting the bag, and Christian Kirk is being drafted as the wide receiver 27. Zay Jones, the spot starter, who had himself a fine year, wide receiver 57. So the market is saying we are so super confident that Calvin Ridley, who hasn't played football, in 700 days is the number one that we are taking him as the wide receiver 17. And I think that that is not just a mistake. I think that is an egregious mistake. Where, where do you have I, him? I'm ashamed to tell you. Oh, oh I, I know. I'm, I'm I, I excited had, to tell I you. I had built up multiple bullet points of agreement with my <laughs> Oh, no. In my oh, head. No! And then I pulled up my stats. I mean, there were going to be things like, hey, look, this team is kind of agnostic. They target who's open, and Zay Jones is actually very good. And Christian Kirk is a viable – he was a free agent signing for tons of money. Like He's going to get his. And then Evan Ingram. And then I scroll over to my rankings, and Calvin Ridley wide is my 17. wide receiver 17. <laughs> it's exactly – You, sir, are the problem. <laughs> I'm the problem. I just hey. learned – it's me. <laughs> I just learned that I'm the problem, apparently. <laughs> now, what I'm worried about is the look Jason's giving me. Because are you part of the problem with me? I am part of the – we'll call it a problem here. <laughs> but I think it's a solution. Look, I was anti-Calvin Ridley. Uh, pri I, didn't, I didn't draft him prior to doing the stats, prior to looking into this. I think you make very compelling arguments, Mike. The risk, the <laughs> risk. I've thrown out the window because I, because yeah. Jason has him ranked yeah. at. Let me, let I've me, got him at sixteen. I'm wide receiver sixteen. I'll counter with this. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. So, as you said, I, he's correct. I've got, I've got him with um, a, a very high risk number because I, you're, you're taking a lot of projection and a lot of hope and you're mixing it together. And saying, man, this would be great if it comes out on top. That being said, there is a world where Calvin Ridley, who, when he was, you know, an NFL player, was in, one of the best wide receivers in, in the 2019. game. 2019. He has shown very good ability. He has been working with this team for a while now. Um, he was allowed back with the, the, the team um, before he was able to play. He's not too old for the position and if he comes out and no, he's gives 28 trevor lawrence a true one and trevor lawrence takes a step forward 
uh, See, uh, Calvin me, Ridley to me could be a you know you talk about the the guys who could be a, a wide receiver one this year. I think he could be. Uh, I I'm not projecting him there, but at wide receiver sixteen, I've I've taken a handful there of are, Calvin Ridley in in my recent drafts. There are risks involved with Calvin Ridley, no question about it. You know, if you go and read his his story about what has transpired over the last seven hundred days, it includes a lot of information about the work ethic of this player prior to the disruption and you know with his time with Julio the kind of effort he puts in the two things yes. that stand out to me about Calvin Ridley historically speaking I, I understand there's narratives about playing on the other side of Julio Jones but it's it's the yards per catch the ability to pile up yardage and the ability to be a touchdown guy in multiple seasons 10 7 and 9 that was playing with some other wide receivers that were very talented and the touchdown totals. So that's why he's at the he's at the tippy top of the upside of this wide receiver room to me, despite the fact he has that risk. Um I'm really disappointed, Andy. <laughs> I just went into Mike's stat doc and I was just so hoping that hoping you would have that, discovered that it was that like, he, Oh Mike, you've got him at eighteen. But you do have Calvin Ridley and Christian Kirk back to back yes. at twenty seven, twenty eight. Um which and, is more of an even distribution yes. projection for that team, which is like I have Kirk it's very with, possible. I have Kirk with the higher target share, but Calvin Ridley is a a big play guy. And my this yeah. rant this rant here is not. I think it's impossible for Calvin Ridley. It's like, cool your jets a little it, bit. It's just if in best ball right now, the wide receiver seventeen versus. I mean, like it's not as ex. Uh, I'm I'm twisting the situation because I was thinking of like Gabe Davis last year where it was. Yeah, uh, he's the the looks like the number two for the for the team, and you're just you've taken s just a small sample, and you're projecting this huge leap forward, and it still would be a huge leap forward for Calvin Ridley to go for the last time we saw him be actively good, which was 2020, as the wide receiver two for his team, now be the number one on this team with a brand new system all around him, and pay off the wide receiver 1780p. I definitely don't believe that Doug Peterson, Trevor Lawrence and company are going to approach the season as Calvin Ridley is supposed to be our alpha. I think there's a 0% chance of that. He is coming into this room after 700 days with an opportunity that Jacksonville gave them, but their loyalty is obviously to Christian Kirk and, and the rest of this room as well, not just Calvin Ridley. So I don't think he's coming in as the alpha, but I think he's good enough to potentially earn it through the year he if he still has the skill. The final overreaction I want to get to here requires you to remove your turd-colored glasses. Mm, okay, hold on. What? Which have been the only glasses you could have worn to glance in the direction of Phoenix, Arizona and the Arizona Cardinals this offseason. You don't need glasses for that, my man. The turd. You just look. You mm -hmm. just look. Yeah. You're looking at a turd. <laughs> yeah. No, the glasses are I took perfectly the glasses normal. I still a turd. <laughs> Uh, look, it's garbage vibes in Arizona this offseason. We've we've got a new head coach, a new general manager. Trust the process. We have an ACL injured, now recovering Kyler Murray. We have uh, essentially made the best players on our team mad at us, <laughs> uh, which has included uh, you know Buda Baker and now DeAndre Hopkins. The vibes all offseason long. This is just a kind of uh, – this was inspired in part by seeing where – how high he was in Jason's rankings. Remember how good DeAndre Hopkins is and was when healthy and what he's capable of. I think he is getting buried. I have seen him in best ball and MFL drafts just ignored. Um, and, 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 and it's not something you should be doing with a talent as good as DeAndre Hopkins. He is not done in this league before the injury. Kyler was averaging over 20 fantasy points a game. The quarterback six. He should be back early in the year. And Hopkins right now, he has not departed. He is a, he had a 29% target share. He was averaging almost 11 targets a game, 75 receiving yards a game. That is what he's capable of. And this was the wide receiver. You know, he's he's playing alongside Hollywood Brown, who is very, very good. <laughs> who I think is very, very good heading into his contract year. But if if Hopkins drops far enough, I think you take the chance. I think you take the opportunity. Last year, we couldn't say that because he was going into the season 
And this might be why I think the overreaction will happen too, but he wasn't there. Yeah. You had six weeks where you didn't get to have any DeAndre Hopkins, and the investment you made was on a suspended player that was going to take a spot on your bench, not go on your IR. And so he's ignored by the time he comes back because your first six weeks, they are an imprint on you as a fantasy player. But DeAndre Hopkins is still one of the best pure receivers in football. Well, when he comes back, he's the wide receiver 10, the wide receiver 2. Everything is great. He's on fire. And then Kyler gets injured. And Kyler misses a couple of games. And so you're going, well, yeah, but what if Kyler is missing? Well, the two games that Kyler missed there, he was the wide receiver 15 and the wide receiver 15 on 14 targets and 12 targets, 10 receptions, 9 receptions, respectively, 98 yards, 91 yards. This is without Kyler. Uh, in those, those games, are the, those are the Colt McCoy games, right? Yeah, yeah, those are the Colt McCoy games, and then and then later in the season when Kyler got uh, injured, injured, uh, Hopkins missed that time. So you, you uh, I I would agree with you. Yeah, obviously, a- my my rankings have him pretty high, but he's he is still an NFL alpha. He's like one of the best wide receivers in the league, and so whoever comes in is going to target him heavily, and he's going to do good things with it. There, there have been. Like, if you don't like the injury concerns, I mean, he's gotten himself banged up quite often. But there are, I mean, you know, Mike Williams, Christian Watson, the aforementioned Calvin Ridley, DJ Moore, these are all players going ahead of DeAndre Hopkins right now. And so I know it's not easy to look at that situation in Arizona, but I think that there are some opportunities there. So, you know, I know you thought about putting a bet on that 45 win total in Arizona I did you did put a bet I did put a bet yeah and not not saying that you believe they're playoff bound no no I think they're gonna be a trash team um but four and a half wins is is too low and the Kyler health is a question mark that right now you can capitalize on because the assumption obviously with uh you know the the actual win totals here for the Cardinals on the season um and the assumption for Hopkins and Kyler's you look at where Kyler's being drafted it's like he is guaranteed to miss half the season at least. And there still exists a world where he is ready week one or misses two weeks and comes in week three. And if that happens, then all these values, um, they're not they're not going to be, you know, the, the, the Cardinals aren't going to the playoffs, but it's mispriced right now. Yeah, I agree. So guess what? It's back. <laughs> Best Ball Breakdown, presented by Underdog Fantasy. Not only is it back, but we have finally fixed the graphic. Mm-hmm. It looked pretty nice. Yes. Um, look, every single week we're going to have a best ball segment leading up into the season. Um, the segment will not simply be watching Jason draft <laughs> in best ball it's every just, two it's seconds. It's pure silence and some grimaces. Some, mm, I have just started a, ooh. like I, I definitely don't play as much as much best ball as maybe Kyle and Jason do well, because no one does because it's impossible physically um, without the team of assistants Jason has surrounded himself with to draft <laughs> mm-hmm. but we're doing a weekly best ball segment I have just started um, ironically a best ball mania for uh, draft I am a handful of picks in we're going to talk about a little a little overview of best ball and a little overview of maybe some things that we have seen change on the platform change in the draft uh tendencies between 2022 and 2023 um i noticed right out of the gate in my first best ball draft this offseason and i wondered how dumb i was how many wide receivers were going off the board so jason maybe a little lay of the land yeah you want to talk about overreactions you can you can look at the what's happening right now in best ball leagues which is so f- yeah, first of all let's over- let's, let's rewind level. here Maybe you haven't played best ball. You've heard us talk about best ball. You, maybe, maybe you've you don't played even, worse ball leagues. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe you don't even know what it is. Best ball is absolutely wonderful. It is for <laughs> fantasy football players because this is where you, you go and you do a draft. Uh, you could do it in a uh, fast draft. You know, it takes 40 minutes and you just have fun doing that. Or, I, you know, I'm always in the slow drafts. If you want to join 20, me. I'm, what is it? Uh, is 24 hours a pick or is it? Uh, seven no, the, hours a pick? No, the clock is like 10 hours a pick. Okay. Uh, or seven hours. I don't know. I'm always on the clock. It's eight. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we got there. We threw out so many numbers. I know. I could, <laughs> well, we corrected it. We got yeah, there we in got the there. end. Um, and you can you could do one of two things. You can be in like a 12-man league and just basically 
draft the team you want, and then at the end, you don't do anything. You don't do waivers. You don't do start sits. Your best lineup play is every single week. So once you're done with the draft, yes, draft you go. follow it along through the season if you want, or you just check in at the end of the year and we're like, how did I do? But it is so good for getting better at fantasy, so good for knowing what are the strategies being used, how are people playing, because people are putting $3, $5, $10, $25 down on on every single one of these things. So they're trying to win money. They're trying to uh, make the best team they can. Um, and then the other thing you could do if you don't just do like a 12-man league is you could do Best Ball Mania 4, their new big giant tournament. There are $15 million in total prizes, $3 million to first place, and, and I love this this year, a third of it is going to the regular season champ. So you don't just have to worry about uh, the week 17 playoff week, you know, take it all home. I, I love that because I think the best players, probably whoever wins the, uh, the, the majority of the season. Uh, but there's a lot of fun things. So, yeah, today we wanted to say what were the things that st stood out to us that are different this year than last year if you have played on underdog uh, for best ball. The one that st stood out to me is that quarterbacks have been pushed up immensely this last year. If you didn't have Jalen Hurts, you better have Josh Allen. If you didn't have Josh Allen, you better have had Patrick Mahomes. If you didn't have one of those three, ah, sorry, well, that, yeah, sorry. Thanks, thanks for good try. Uh, put a put a lot of uh, good quarterbacks together and hope you got lucky because those guys were just so good. And so, if you look back at the last couple of years, twenty twenty, the amount of uh, quarterbacks being drafted in the first five rounds there were two. In twenty twenty one, there were four. In twenty twenty two, there were five. Oh. And now this year, these right now, trends continue. eight quarterbacks are going in the first five rounds. Those big three I mentioned, they are in the second round every draft. I've never seen, a, in any of the drafts I've done, never seen one of those three guys make it out of the second round. So you are paying a premium for those three players. And I think when I look at what's happening is I think those three players, who th there was a giant gap between them and the rest of the field. They have pushed up the next five yep. too high. I Look, I just had to take Herbert in the fifth round Yeah, because he was the last of what I viewed as a tier of difference-making quarterbacks because Fields and Burrow were gone right before me, and it was like – and Lamar's gone, and Hurts is gone, and Allen and Mahomes. It's um, at least held true in the draft I'm in right now. Yeah, so that's something that you've got to wrestle with. Are you willing to take one of those three great quarterbacks – um, early on in your draft. If not, personally, if I'm not doing that, I'm I'm going to go with the three quarterback, uh, try to build and, and get some cheap later options and try to pair a Tua with a Derek Carr with a, uh, you know, last round Mac Jones and just hope that the, the you know, the uh, spread approach works if I can't get one of those humongous names. Yeah, and so all of our, like when we give you the best ball ADP data, it's coming in – you know, from the underdog fantasy best ball app. And, and, you know, some, there are differences between what you're seeing, you know, obviously in your week to week drafts and the numbers that we're quoting for some of these redraft arguments, you know, I don't know where Richardson's value is going to be in redraft compared to where it is right now, ADP wise, because, you know, he's a home run, mm -hmm. right? He's, he's the potential to win it all and, and be the player at the end of the year where you're like, well, no one won any leagues if they didn't have Anthony Richardson. That type of player, um, as opposed to maybe a low, you know, ceiling type of Kirk quarterback, Kirk Cousins, Derek Carr. Um, so some of those things are, are definitely going to be variations between redraft and best ball. Mike, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a Ours natural are, yeah. outcropping from seeing wide receivers and quarterbacks earlier, but you wanted to talk about running backs. Yeah, it's, if the wide receivers are up, that means that the running backs are getting pushed down. Um, look in 2020, 14 running backs off the board in the top 20 picks. That's very high T very robust. And now there are five running backs in the top 20 picks. As of right now, CMC, Bijan, Eckler, Johnny Taylor, and Saquon Barkley. And part of all fantasy football drafts, it has been, you take a quarterback or I'm sorry, a running back in the, in the first two rounds, if that's how you play the game. And then in the it's basically like the back of the third through the fifth round has been by the fantasy football community dubbed it's the dead zone of running backs because all the starters are gone. 
and those who are like, I got to have a running back. And you're just, so you're taking, I mean, you're taking like the low end starters. You're taking like even backup running backs at that point. I mean, it's, it gets really brutal there. But now because they're getting pushed down in the third round, Derrick Henry, Josh Jacobs, brother, Ramondre Stevenson. I, I mean, couldn't resist the names. <laughs> like th that's outrageous value to get a, a a running back of that caliber in the third, mm -hmm. and then in the fourth. I mean, it's it's not necessarily as great, but Jameer Gibbs, high upside. But Najee Harris, Najee Harris is he's not an elite first round running back, but he is not a dead zone running back. He's he, a guy that you sh you'd be super happy to have as I, a real stable running back. I just back got too. Kenneth Walker in the late fourth. Yeah, there you go. And so, I mean, it's, it's the ebbs and the flows of, of playing the market. It's just, you need to be aware that these things are happening. Um, because I don't mind, I don't, I don't mind going wide receiver, wide receiver. If you're getting Derrick Henry, like if you're slotted that you can get one of those, running backs in the third as your RB1, that's wild. Yeah, you just need to have a strategy when you're when you're taking that first round pick and you say, okay, this is the way that I'm going to play this uh, this specific draft because you could you can have hundreds of these drafts if you want or, or dozens or, or two or three and, and or play dozen with your hundreds, uh, dozen hundreds, <laughs> you play with your builds. And, and as the as we ramp up and get closer to fantasy season, we're going to be giving you guys uh, tips and lay of the lands and, and all sorts of uh, information on basically how to construct your roster and uh be good at this because we want you guys to succeed and have fun like we're doing uh before you close it out though i am on the clock and i want you guys to make my pick okay all right debo my t <laughs> uh i i think he is gone we are we are a little bit later i need one of these wide receivers quentin johnston zay flowers rashad bateman or juju yeah it's quentin johnston for me i would go bateman well, since I've got flowers ahead of Bateman, Quentin Johnston, it is. All right. All right. That was Best Ball Breakdown presented by Underdog Fantasy. Get your first deposit matched up to $100. Use the code BALLERS. That is going to do it for today's episode of the podcast. Thank you for joining us. A reminder, if you want to get tickets to see us live in L.A., you can go to BallersLive.com. And if you want to pre-order the UDK, that is UltimateDraftKit.com. Until next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.